about half of the Saudi daily crude production. Iran's president claimed the attack was a response to the aggression in Yemen. Tyler. Contessa, thank you very much. The Federal Aviation Administration has a new person at the helm, and he is facing one of the biggest challenges in Washington. That would be getting Boeing 737 MAX jet back into service and convincing travelers the airliner is safe. Our own Phil LeBeau has a Power Lunch exclusive, the very first TV interview with a new FAA Administrator, Steve Dixon. Phil, take it away. Thank you, Tyler. Steve, thank you for joining us today from the FAA headquarters. Uh, let's get straight to this. You guys are in the process of recertifying the 737 MAX. Dennis Bullenberg, the CEO of Boeing, has said he believes that the plane will be recertified and back in service by the end of this year. What's your take on the situation right now, and is that an accurate mm -hmm. estimate by Mr. Mullenberg? Well, first of all, Phil, it's a pleasure to be with you today. And uh, as you know, the highest responsibility that, uh, that I have as the FAA Administrator is ensuring the safety of the traveling public in the U.S. and around the world. And uh, that's going to be our absolutely uh, first priority in terms of getting the MAX flying again. It's, it's, it's really uh, safety first, and uh, we're not on any specific timeline. We still have not seen the final systems description and safety analysis from Boeing. We expect to get that in the coming days, and then we'll see where we go from there. You know that a number of other countries and regions, whether it's Europe, whether it's India, today the United Arab Emirates out with some comments about whether they will want to do their own tests in terms of recertifying or saying, yes, we think the MAX is safe to fly. Do you think it's more likely than not that the FAA is likely to certify the MAX to fly here in the United States, but it may be well into next year before it's cleared to fly in other parts of the world? Well, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, I frankly think that uh, this process really has been very transparent. We have involved an unprecedented number of international avi aviation and uh, certification safety authorities uh, in this effort, and we're working very hard to ensure that, that everyone is aligned. Ultimately, validating the work of other certification authorities is not anything unusual. We do it with respect to uh, other certifications in other jurisdictions around the world, and I certainly would, uh, would welcome that. Additionally, I would say that we welcome the scrutiny, we welcome the, the, uh, you know, the, the diligence of this entire process, because ultimately it will make us a more effective uh, safety regulator and even raise the margin of safety in our system even higher than it, than it is uh, already at unprecedented levels. Steve, as you know, uh, President Trump has been very vocal about the 737 MAX. He has blasted Boeing, said, look, just rename the plane. Nobody's going to want to fly it when it's recertified. Do you talk often with the president about the MAX? And, and what's his take uh, based on your conversations with him? Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, I'm qualified on the 737 as well as a, a number of other aircraft. Uh, I'm anxious to get out to Seattle later this week and look into this myself and, uh, and see where we are with, uh, with the certification process. And I can guarantee you that the airplane will not be flying again until I'm satisfied uh, that it is uh, the safest thing out there. Tyler Matheson uh, at uh, Tyler, headquarters. Tyler, go ahead. Do you have a question? Thank, thank you, Phil. I do, uh, Mr. Dixon. Uh, I know you're new to the job, and so maybe this is a, a little unfair, but I wonder if you have identified any uh, flaws in the process of certifying that, that 737 MAX, either at the FAA's level or within uh, Boeing's processes that may have contributed to uh, the crashes that took place. Have you, have you put your finger on anything that you think needs changing? Well, first of all, Tyler, it's a great question. And with respect to the, uh, the crashes first, uh, first of all, my, my heart and my prayers go out uh, to the families of the uh, Lion Air and uh, Ethiopian uh, 302 crashes. These accidents should not have happened. And uh, there does appear to be some common thread between them, but it's very important that we not uh, prejudge exactly what the root cause was. But I, I certainly think that, uh, that uh, this whole situation has uh, provided an opportunity for us to look at our processes, 
look how the process, uh, examine how the processes were executed, and and make in, uh, put any appropriate changes that need to be uh, put into place. Make sure that those are implemented. I look forward to doing that uh, in the coming months and years. I also, uh, it's Kelly here back at headquarters, have, have a question as well. There's been criticism that the FAA and Boeing were too close. The New York Times said agency managers made decisions uh, about the certification based in part on Boeing's timing and budget needs. Uh, was the relationship between the FAA and Boeing too close in the past, and will it change going forward? Well, I can, I can assure you that my emphasis is going to be on uh, making sure that the safety bar is as high as it can be. And, uh, and certainly, in terms of my experience in the industry, I will apply the same things that I have learned in terms of regulating uh, safety with the manufacturers as well. I think it's important that we, that we are able to collaborate, uh, and, uh, and I don't think that delegation per se as a concept is, uh, is a bad thing. I think it actually makes the agency a more effective regulator, and it makes the manufacturer a more effective and safer manufacturer. But how it was implemented in this particular case, and in general, those are the kinds of things we need to look at to make sure that there aren't gaps in the processes, and to make sure that, uh, that it's absolutely as tight as it can be. Steve, this is Phil again. One last question. Uh, whenever the MAX is recertified, you know and almost everybody expects that there is going to be a fairly large number of people who will say, I don't want to get on it. If I book a flight on a particular airline, I'm not flying the MAX. How do you convince the flying public that the MAX is safe once you recertify it? Well, certainly my, my job, again, is to make sure that we follow every step of the process and that the airplane is, is safe for us to fly, not only in the U.S., with U.S. pilots, but around the world. And as a pilot myself, I can tell you that I will not allow this airplane to fly uh, unless I would fly it myself and put my own family on it, and that's my commitment. And Steve, just to be clear, you're going to be out in Seattle later this week. Will you get in the simulator with the modified MCAS software and test it out yourself? Yes, I will. I'll be interested to see what you have to say about it. I'm not sure you'll give us an update right away, but I think uh, that has to be a first. I'm not sure how often an FAA administrator uh, has gone into a simulator to test out uh, changes with uh, some of the software with a commercial airplane. Stephen Dixon, the administrator for the Federal Aviation Administration, joining us exclusively here on Power Lunch. Tyler, Kelly, guys, back to you. You know, Phil, uh, we see that you're out in Michigan uh, near one of the uh, plants that are on strike against the, uh, uh, the GM, the UAW against the GM. Uh, so what is the latest? What can you tell us about any talks that are taking place and, and how far apart are the two parties? Well, with all negotiations, Tyler, uh, it's a little bit of taking what you hear from both sides and kind of distilling it down to saying, okay, are they really that far apart? There is a wide gap in terms of expectations when it comes to job guarantees, which the FAA wants, and the number of temporary workers. Temporary workers have allowed General Motors to be much more flexible, much more efficient, and that's what you want from an auto manufacturer. You want that flexibility. On the flip side, the FAA or the uh, UAW is saying, uh-uh, we want those guarantees. We want more jobs here in the United States. Yes, they're back at the bargaining table, but it may be that we go several days, if not a couple of weeks, before we see a deal. All right, Phil LeBeau, thank you very much. Phil LeBeau reporting on airlines and autos. We have some sad news to share. The longtime auto industry journalist, author, and friend of CNBC, Paul Ingrazia, passed away earlier today. He spent many years as the Detroit bureau chief at the Wall Street Journal, later became the president of the Dow Jones Newswire. He wrote several books about the American car business and in 1993 won a Pulitzer Prize for his reporting on the management crisis at GM. Paul joined the network uh, and this program many times to lend his insights. He was a friend, one of the really good guys, and he will be greatly missed. Old Dominion has ranked number one. For people who want to feel happier, stronger, fitter, get further, faster, better. For people who want to, but don't always manage to. It doesn't matter how you want to do it, who you want to do it with. It matters that you want to. Virgin Active. We'll find a way for you. 
Join in September and get 15% off each month on 12-month memberships. Visit virginactive.co.uk. Participating gyms. Terms and conditions apply. This one shouldn't take long. Of course, if it had a cover, I might not be bothered. Can't see what's under there. And they'd have chained the bat wheel. It would have taken me much longer, especially if the chain's off the ground. Makes it harder to cut. This one doesn't even have a lock on the front. So, in the time I've been talking to you, I've nicked it. Over 9,000 scooters and motorbikes were stolen in London last year. Lock your bike, chain the rear wheel, and cover it to make it harder to steal. Lock, chain, cover. The Met Police. One in two people believe they should check their work email on holiday. One in three believe it's okay to eat a colleague's lunch. And one in 14 believe it's okay to steal loo roll from work. People believe all sorts of strange things. Some people believe that insurance companies try to avoid paying claims. But last year, Zurich paid 99% of insurance claims made by their UK customers. Zurich, an insurance company you can believe in. To find out more, visit zurich.co.uk slash 99. Get smart, get savvy and get saving this month at Tesco Mobile with some of our best ever prices on the latest phones. Like the Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus, now only $34.49 a month. A huge saving of £144. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Ends 29th of September. S10 Plus savings based on £4 per month. 36-month credit agreement. 24-month usual agreement. Subject to status phase. Policy applies. See tescomobile.com slash terms. So, what did you think of the movie, Mr. Alexander? Ah, oh, the cinematography. Incredible. Breathtaking. The movie itself was full of curious trademark themes and wonderful characteristic compositions. Oh, but... And the payoffs and character arcs were nothing short of masterful storytelling. How about you, Sergei? Uh, for a kid's film, I thought the animals were fun. <laughs> Enjoy more time together with two-for-one cinema tickets from Meerkat Movies with the Meerkat app. When you buy, so compare the market. Qualifying purchase. Chooses Wednesdays only. Participating cinemas. T's and C's apply. Welcome back, everybody. Netflix landing a major victory in the growing battle for content. It has acquired global streaming rights to the hit sitcom Seinfeld. Yada, yada, yada. Let's go to Julia Borston in L.A. for more. Julia. Tyler, Netflix will stream all 180 episodes of Seinfeld to its subscribers all around the world starting in 2021. That's when its deal with Sony Pictures Television, which controls those Seinfeld rights, kicks in. Now, the iconic show is moving to Netflix from Hulu, which paid $150 million for five years access to domestic rights, and Amazon, which had most of the foreign rights to Seinfeld. Now, this is a big move for Netflix after losing rights to two of the most popular shows streamed on its platform. Friends is moving over to Warner Media's HBO Max next year, and The Office is moving from Netflix over to NBC Universal streaming platform starting in the year 2021. Now, we don't have an official price tag for how much Netflix is paying for Seinfeld streaming rights, but it is paying globally reportedly much more than the $500 million that NBC Universal spent for the domestic rights to The Office and the $425 million that uh, HBO Max is reportedly spending for those domestic rights to friends. So it is a bigger price tag, but they are paying for the global rights as well. Interesting to keep that in mind, Tyler. Julia, thank you very much. Julia Borston out in California. Coming up, Purdue Pharma filing for bankruptcy protection. What that all means for the lawsuits it's facing. Plus, the rally taking a pause today as oil's big jump in price weighs on stocks. What do the markets need to hear from the Fed this week to send stocks to new highs? We'll cover that when we come right back. At Fidelity, we believe your money should... For people who want to feel happier, stronger, fitter, get further, faster, better... For people who want to, but don't always manage to. It doesn't matter how you want to do it, who you want to do it with. It matters that you want to. Virgin Active. We'll find a way for you. Join in September and get 15% off each month on 12-month memberships. Visit virginactive.co.uk. Participating gyms. Terms and conditions apply. This one shouldn't take long. Of course, if it had a cover, I might not be bothered. Can't see what's under there. And they'd have chained the bat wheel. It would have taken me much longer, especially if the chain's off the ground. Makes it harder to cut. This one doesn't even have a lock on the front. 
So, in the time I've been talking to you, I've nicked it. Over 9,000 scooters and motorbikes were stolen in London last year. Lock your bike, chain the rear wheel, and cover it to make it harder to steal. Lock, chain, cover. The Met Police. One in four children believe potatoes grow on trees. One in five children believe fish fingers are made from chicken. And one in eight adults believe the moon landings didn't happen. People believe all sorts of strange things. Some people believe that insurance companies try to avoid paying claims. But last year, Zurich paid 99% of insurance claims made by their UK customers. Zurich, an insurance company you can believe in. To find out more, visit zurich.co.uk slash 99. British summer can be as unpredictable as the weather. Footwear dilemma. Introducing convertible wellies. One minute they're wellies and boots, the next flip-flops. Ooh, slightly embarrassing. Convertible wellies will never happen. However, with a new BP Me Rewards card, getting more of the summer essentials you love more often will. Search BP Me Rewards to find out more. BP. Every day. Brighter. I need to get to Birmingham in exactly one hour, 22 minutes. But how? A chair? But rocket-powered. Is that a thing? A chair on rockets? On rockets! A big fat rocket fest! Hmm, does sound a little dicey. Okay. How about a nice comfy chair on lovely sturdy wheels? Yeah, on super fast tracks. Double yeah. And wait, is it a virgin train now? I suppose it is. Well, good. I'll do that. Virgin Trains, London to Birmingham in one hour, 22 minutes. To advertise the McCafe range from McDonald's, we could use the silkiest, smoothest, sensualist voice to deliver a silky, sensual voiceover about the smoothness of the Arabica beans in our coffee, drawing comparisons between the voiceover and the smooth, sensual silkiness of said beans. We could do all that. But we don't. What we do is use freshly ground Arabica beans and organic milk. McCafe. Great tasting coffee. Simple. <laughs> Welcome back. Purdue Pharma is filing for bankruptcy protection as it deals with potentially billions of dollars of liability related to OxyContin. Meg Terrell is here with the latest allegations about the Sackler family. Hey, guys. Well, that's right. We're told the attention at least of at least some states does now turn to the Sackler family after Purdue Pharma declared bankruptcy as part of a negotiated settlement in the massive set of opioid cases that it faces. Now, I spoke this morning with Joe Rice of Motley Rice, one of the co-lead attorneys for the plaintiffs in the multi-district litigation. That's, of course, the collection of more than 2,000 lawsuits from cities, states, and others filed against Purdue and other companies. Now, they are on board with the Purdue arrangement, and he said they filed a motion now to sever Purdue from that litigation, and they'll continue the suits against the other defendants. He indicated that this isn't a done deal for Purdue. It's the beginning of a process that creditors will have to vote on. Our David Faber heard similarly this morning from Purdue's chairman, Steve Miller. And there are a number of states that effusively object to the settlement, including New York, which has also sued individual members of the billionaire Sackler family. Friday, the state's attorney general's office said it had tracked a billion dollars in wire transfers from the family, including through Swiss bank accounts. New York AG Letitia James saying in a statement out just now, quote, it shouldn't come as a shock that Purdue's bankruptcy filing comes just 48 hours after my office exposed the transfers, saying her office, quote, will not be deterred in its lawsuit against the Sackler family. And the Sacklers, for their part, guys, say that these were decade-old transfers and that they're perfectly legal. All right, Meg, thank you very much. Thank you. What a saga here. Mm -hmm. All right, the market stuck in a tight range as the S&P falls back below 3,000. Reacting to mounting global tensions as we ramp up to the Fed's rate cut decision later this week. Joining us now, Fast Money Trader, CNBC contributor Steve Grasso. Steve, welcome. Good to have you with us. Good to be here. Thanks, Tyler. Is, is what happened over the weekend in Saudi Arabia likely to do lasting damage to equity values? I, I can't see that happening. And, you know, it is, it is pretty uh, astounding how... The market was allowed to get ahead of itself uh, with the rotation where you saw them coming out of growth, going into value. At least those firms that were short energy had a chance to cover something last week because this is a, a, a pretty impressive move, but I do not think it is lasting damage. Look at where we are. We're just an eye shot of all-time highs, so I don't think the market uh, should have any problem with absorbing it unless it cascades out of control. Yeah. The market momentum has been really quite something since late August, wouldn't you say? It, it has been uh, sort of the unloved rally and the positioning yeah. rally. Huh. And, and when we hit that 28, 22 level in August, people got short at that level. 
So if they're getting short on the lows, it really has a rebound effect where everyone was on the wrong side of the boat. And now you have a couple of months towards year end to really make up for those positions and to reestablish where your long should be. And that's what we're seeing right now. You know, uh, one of the big moves, apart from what's going on in stocks, where a a month ago everybody was uh, relatively certain that we were going to have a recession very soon. Now uh, that seems uh, much less in the cards. Uh, But the big move in uh, bond yields on the 10-year has been, I wouldn't say nothing short of shocking, but it's, it's really gone, it's really moved. Isn't it amazing, Tyler, that we were worried about rates spiraling upward, and now then we were worried about rates going below zero, and now we're worried about them uh, ticking higher and getting out of control the other way. So I, I think uh, it's a very humbling, humbling process for uh, people who trade in the overall markets, but I think you have to stay the course. You're long the market, markets move higher. We're an eye shot of, as I said before, all-time highs. I do believe that this little blip that we're seeing in the oil markets, the energy markets, uh, is probably going to be just that. Trump is uh, talking about releasing strategic reserves where OPEC can cut back on what was their old supply cuts. Granted, that's only going to be 900,000 barrels, but you still have the ability to catch this falling knife, so to speak. So I think if you're slow and steady, worry about the Fed. But we already know what we're getting there. It was going to be 25 or 50. Now we're 25 basis points. You're going to get a cut. Be invested in the marketplace. And I think last week or two weeks ago, Tyler, I said 29.79 is the level to watch in the S&P cash. We're at 29.99. As long as we're above that, keep investing in the overall market. Below that, you have some support. But it really is in a tight trading range. I would stay invested. Don't uh, start throwing out things that you uh, that you want to own in the long run. All right, Steve, great to see you again. Thank you. Good to see you, Todd. Steve Grasso. Why are more and more Wall Street billionaires buying stakes in sports teams? The answer to that is coming up next on Power Lunch. Pain thinks it makes the rules. For people who want to feel happier, stronger, fitter, get further, faster, better. For people who want to, but don't always manage to. It doesn't matter how you want to do it, who you want to do it with. It matters that you want to. Virgin Active. We'll find a way for you. Join in September and get 15% off each month on 12-month memberships. Visit virginactive.co.uk. Participating gyms. Terms and conditions apply. What's that, Britain? You want unlimited data? Oh, you want more. You want it on the unstoppable, unbeaten, unrivaled number one network? Well, who says you can't? Get unlimited data on EE Today, the UK's unrivaled number one network. Unlimited data, personal use only. Terms apply. Root metrics comparison of four mobile networks, H2 2013 to H1 2019. See ee.co.uk. One in two people believe they should check their work email on holiday. One in three believe it's okay to eat a colleague's lunch. And one in 14 believe it's okay to steal loo roll from work. People believe all sorts of strange things. Some people believe that insurance companies try to avoid paying claims. But last year, Zurich paid 99% of insurance claims made by their UK customers. Zurich, an insurance company you can believe in. To find out more, visit zurich.co.uk slash 99. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. Brexit will bring changes that affect businesses in many ways, particularly if you buy from EU suppliers, sell to EU customers, provide services to EU clients, and receive customer data from other businesses in the EU. Businesses need to prepare. Find out how at gov.uk slash Brexit. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. The office waste paper bin. Old documents, expired contracts, now just crumpled up paper. It doesn't sound risky, does it? Security breaches involving sensitive and confidential information continue to rise. Can you be sure all your information is secure? Book a free 30-minute data security survey with Shreddit, the document destruction experts, to pinpoint security risks specific to your industry. Search free survey Shreddit to book yours today. Shreddit. We protect what matters. 
Michael Jordan selling off a big piece of the Charlotte Hornets to two prominent Wall Street investors. It's just the latest example of hedge fund money investing in sports teams. Eric Chemi has more. That's right. So it's a really interesting story going on here. Jordan is selling that chunk of the team to two New York hedge fund owners, Gabe Plotkin of Melvin Capital and Daniel Sundheim of D1 Capital. For Jordan, the deal is a chance to turn paper profits into real money. He bought the Hornets nine years ago. The team at the time was worth less than $300 million. Its value has grown by a cool billion since then. He owned 97% of the team before this deal, so he still keeps control even after selling off a big chunk. He gets to add younger owners to his team with tech and finance experience. That can help grow their business in the long run. But if you look at the buyers, what does it mean for them? It represents a growing trend of Wall Street titans looking to get a piece of pro sports teams even in the smallest markets like Charlotte. If you want to be a majority owner down the road, it's often best for these guys to start with a minority stake somewhere on some team so the league can vet them and possibly put them in line to take over the next team that comes up for a majority sale. For some, it's about ego, joining the big country club. For others, it's a financial investment as these team values keep on growing. Look for more minority deals like this to keep happening with these profits so high. That's an amazing increase in value from under $300 million to $1.3 billion. And they're like the third ball. cheapest team in the NBA. Yeah. That's why a lot of these owners, experts are telling me today, you're going to see a lot of the majority owners want to get some of these profits. Let's say he sells $300 million today. He's basically now got the team for free right, from right. what he had to pay or whatever it was worth nine years ago. So more of these guys are going to do this. The valuations of the team are so expensive that individuals can't afford four billion dollar team so you're going to need more people to get together i don't remember what mark lassery and his partners paid for the milwaukee 550 bucks. was the value at the time and the people value. thought it was insane it was an time. insane <laughs> amount of money and now they're all going for well over a billion dollars right exactly I mean, in the nba every team is worth at least a billion dollars and it used to be that the owners were often uh real estate tycoons uh, some had made money in the car business mm -hmm. and, and so forth. Increasingly, a lot of entrepreneurs, in the, but yeah. now it's, it's a lot mostly of Wall Street or the tech Silicon Valley guys. Those the, are the, the tech Silicon groups Valley guys. That are Paul Allen, the, teams, the yeah. late Paul Allen, of course, owned a couple of teams. Exactly, uh, and, and more. And Tyler Matheson will one day own it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll lose money then. I'll tell you, Eric, thanks very much. Got it. Speaking of the NBA tomorrow, we will be joined by Houston Rockets owner and Landry's chairman Tillman Fertitta. We're going to talk to him about restaurants, the economy, basketball, and his new business book, Shut Up and Listen. He'll be with us for the whole show, so don't miss that. And before we go, yeah, please. you and I were both raising some eyebrows. Speaking of, of high valuations, what they're paying to, for Seinfeld at Netflix? For these shows, Julia said more than a half a billion for the global streaming rights to a program that has made probably at least that amount in syndication and ended, what was it, 20 21 years ago. I'm glad that they made their money. Their, the, the, the people, the stars in the show made their money while they did because they're making tons off of these shows now. It's unbelievable. Thanks for watching Power Lunch. Everybody. Closing bell right now. Welcome to the Closing Bell, everyone. I'm here at the Chevron Post. That stock nicely higher, as is it, the energy sector following oil prices rising after that attack in Saudi Arabia. Though the energy sector, one of the few sectors higher, broader markets are lower with 59 minutes left to trade. I'm Sarah Eyes, and welcome everyone. Let's look at what is driving the action lower right now. It is the attack on oil facilities in Saudi Arabia. Oil prices and energy stocks are spiking on concerns of supply disruptions. Those same geopolitical tensions have the rest of the market in risk-off mode. Equities broadly lower, gold higher, treasury yields are slumping. And global growth concerns back in the headlines as China's economic data comes in weaker. Joining us for the entire hour, final hour of trade, is Keith Bliss, managing partner and CEO of IQ Capital USA. Keith, welcome. Thank you very you much. You and I were just chatting about the fact that you are noting you're kind of surprised that the stock market isn't down even worse on such a big spike in oil prices. Yeah, I think it's really resilient. It speaks to the trend that we've been seeing throughout the last 30 days for sure. And I've been a big believer that we will continue to trade higher throughout the uh, rest of the year. When you think about something like this that happened 45 years ago, when we did have real supply concerns and the kingdom of Saudi Arabia was the big player in the market. Now it's much more dispersed. We were uh, not a big player. We were not a big player at all. Yeah, for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, I, I'm... I'm grateful and pleased at the resilience of the equity market on news like this today. Even some energy importing nations like China, for example, you didn't yep. see a big sell-off. 
No, you didn't. Well, China, also remember China and, and Japan had holidays today, so the markets were, oh, well. blunted, were blunted a little bit. But, uh, fact, but, 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 but even still, I think what, what you're saying, though, Wilf, is that the, the mere fact that you do have other places to go buy your oil than just the Mideast is really going to start us. Now, I think what's really interesting is the politics underneath this event, what happened, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Oh, yeah. Let's focus in on today's big move in oil and energy stocks. Seema Modi's covering the stocks moving the most following the strikes in Saudi Arabia over the weekend, which not half the country's output. Eamon Javis has details on the response from the White House and joining us to break it all down here on set, Halima Croft from RBC Capital Markets and Iham Kamel from the Eurasia Group. Seema, first to you. Wolf oil closed up by over 14% on the day, but at one point was up as much as 19%, the highest daily spike in history following Saudi oil facility tax, which knocked out 5.7 million barrels of output, roughly 5% of global supply. Energy is the lone outperformer today, thanks to higher oil prices. You have Devon Energy up 13%, and some of the major producers like Chevron and ExxonMobil also higher on the day. Key questions that traders are now trying to answer. How long will it take Saudi to return to full capacity. Meantime, how will OPEC respond to limit oil disruptions and will key importers in Asia look to alternative suppliers for oil like Russia and the U.S.? Sarah? All good question. Seema, thank you. The Trump administration weighing in early and pledging to support Saudi Arabia. Eamon Javers has more from the White House. Amen. Yes, yeah, Sarah, that's right. The Trump administration is weighing in. We're hearing from some cabinet secretaries here that they are willing to go so far as to place the blame for these attacks directly on Iran. The president has not been willing to do that. Take a look at the president's tweet from earlier today where he raised the issue uh, that Iran was possibly involved here. But then he says now they say they had nothing to do with the attack on Saudi Arabia. We'll see, question mark. So the president not willing to go as far as some of his cabinet members in attributing the blame for those attacks to the Iranians directly. But uh, we will hear from him perhaps momentarily. The president is participating in an event in the Oval Office here shortly. We do expect reporters will be in the room and they will have a chance to ask him about this. So we may hear more directly on camera from the president here in a couple of minutes. And we'll bring that to you if we get, if we get it, sir. And, Eamon, this all sets us up for a pretty interesting UNGA, UN General Assembly meeting sure. at the end of next week. Um, what's the latest on any potential talks between the U.S. and Iran? Well, look, this is a president who has wanted to bring the Iranians to the table, who has suggested in the past that he would meet with Iran without any preconditions. He bristled on Twitter about that today, saying that he never said that he would meet with Iran without any preconditions. But clearly, this is a president who relishes that big set piece negotiate, negotiating uh, style where he can sit down one on one with some of these leaders around the world. We've seen that with Kim Jong un repeatedly. Uh, if he can bring the Iranians to the table, you get the sense that the president might be in a deal making mood. That may be why we're seeing him hold off here on attributing blame here to the Iranians, because he does want them to come to the table. Uh, but that uh, meeting next week will be a key one in New York, and we'll be there for that as well. Eamon, thanks very much for that. Bring us those headlines uh, when the president does uh, speak, we'll do. if he does. Uh, let's bring in Halima Croft from RBC Capital Markets and Iham Kamel from the Eurasia, Eurasia Group. Uh, Halima, start with you. 14% spike in oil prices. Does that feel about right? What, what are the key factors you're looking at from here as to whether that holds, goes further, drops back? I mean, I think the key question in terms of do we get higher on this is what's the timeline for the return of the Saudi barrels? We had heard that potentially one third of production was going to be coming back either today or tomorrow. There's really question marks about that. There's a question about the extent of the damage. Was it more serious than initially reported? Are we looking at an extended outage of, you know, three million plus barrels from Saudi Arabia? And the question is really who fills that gap? I mean, yes, the U.S. is a big producer, but they're not not a swing producer. So the question is, how much is Saudi willing to draw down their inventories? And which other countries that can surge production, how much can they surge to meet supplies into Asia? I mean, Asia is now being supplied still by Saudi by drawing down inventories. The question is, how long can they do that? I think the other question, Halima, is how will King Salman respond? Well, I mean, I think the question is, will King Salman respond? Really, will Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman respond? He is the very hawkish Saudi Crown Prince. He has taken the fight to the Iranians in Yemen in that multi-year conflict. The question is, if you're Saudi Arabia, you've had an escalating series of attacks on your energy infrastructure, starting with the East-West Pipeline being hit in May. The Shaiba field was attacked last month. 
are you going to be willing to just sit back and continue to let these attacks happen? And if you're President Trump, if your officials are saying the attacks came from Iran and not from Yemen, what is the U.S. going to do about this? I am. What is your take on the president's administration, the broader members of the administration's response, uh, specifically how much they pointed the finger at Iran and why the president hasn't done so himself? I think there's a clear rift here. I think many members of the administration see Iran as essentially behind this, and the president knows how to carefully redraw lines. I don't think he wants to get implicated in a war scenario or any military operation that leads to serious casualties. If we do get an escalation with Iran, it isn't simply about the current outage in Saudi Arabia. It's a potential for additional strikes on oil assets. So you're talking oil north of 90, and I'm not sure that's what he's looking for in an election year or in 2020 ahead of elections. So he's very careful, and I think he's redrawing lines. I am. Does it tell us anything about the vulnerability, the fact that, that with drone strikes, I mean, you can, you can wipe out or at least temporarily suspend so much of Saudi Arabia's production, and what's the warning for other oil facilities around the world? Absolutely. I think this has the, the attack that we've seen here, if it's Iran, Iranian proxies, it really is a secondary issue. The, there is asymmetrical warfare here that's going to be copied by everyone. Drones are effective, they're not that expensive, and billions of dollars of sophisticated weaponry is just not able to tackle this issue. So it's, I think it's a structural issue, not only for Saudi Arabia, for, but for many nations. Uh, critical infrastructure is at risk from drones, and we just simply don't have an effective answer yet. Uh, definitely the Saudis are still susceptible to attacks. I don't think that we'll likely see a big attack like this one. Uh, I think the Iranians are likely to be much, much more careful this time around. They probably miscalculated, and this will draw the Europeans closer to the U.S. in terms of sanctioning Iran. I mean, here's the issue, though. I mean, Abcake was considered a very secure facility. In 2006, two al-Qaeda trucks tried to get into the facility and detonate. The Saudis spent billions of dollars on energy security after that foiled al-Qaeda attack. This showed incredible sophistication. I mean, it was drones and apparently missiles as well. Hence why people are questioning whether the Houthis did this alone. And so I do wonder if this is basically all we are going to see. The Houthis are out today saying there will be more attacks. We have seen pipelines hit in May, tankers struck. We've seen oil fields attacked. I question why this is going to be the end if there's no forceful response to the Iranians. Keith, would more uh, attacks spook broader U.S. equity markets? Yeah, I think so. If we started, if we continue to see these attacks and they escalated up more, but I, I, I agree with Halima a little bit. I mean, just look at the messaging that you're starting to get out of MBS saying it's because of Yemen aggression. And also because uh, we're seeing a, a remarkably reserved President Trump on Twitter about this. He clearly doesn't want to engage in some sort of military conflict with Iran. And I think that tells us that there's a lot of back-channeling going on right now, and they'll try to keep it at a minimum so that we don't see this again. Very quickly, the much-unloved energy sector is up almost 4% today, obviously, on higher prices. Do you see that as a sustained move? I really don't. I, I think once we once this comes down and the diplomacy takes over and the Saudis get the oil field back on back online, we're still going to pump. We're still pumping a lot in this country at these prices. I think we see oil come back. We caught it overbought quantitatively this morning when it spiked, so it should come back. All right, we've got to wrap it there. Halima, thank you. Iham Jamal, thank you very much. Good to see you as well. For more on the geopolitical fallout from this weekend's attack, let's bring in Admiral James Stavridis, former Supreme Allied Commander at NATO, who joins us now by phone. Uh, your biography was too long to list. So, Admiral, we're happy to have you. What is President Trump's next move here? Well, I'm in Riyadh, for whatever that's worth. I arrived here Sunday almost when the drones arrived. I'm, I'm not sure the Saudis will give me another visa, given my timing. But I would say that uh, President Trump is going to kind of hit pause here. It's interesting to consider that the most hawkish advisor he had was John Bolton, who I think would have been pushing hard for a, an aggressive response here. So the timing is interesting, if not uh, propitious, that he departed when he did. Right now, uh, pizza boxes are flowing to the Pentagon where they're generating options for the president. And those will kind of run the spectrum from uh, relatively low level increased surveillance uh, gather up the allies, condemn in the U.N. Security Council, deploy the evidence. 
but pretty soon he'll see options like uh, use military force, probably covertly initially, uh, using special forces, using stealth, using cyber attacks, and then there'll be some pretty aggressive options that are put in front of him. I agree with the general tenor of the conversation thus far that uh, the president will be a bit of a speed break on doing anything precipitous here, uh, but certainly there'll be a day or two of quiet. We'll get a damage assessment from the Saudis. That's when the next set of moves will really start to unfold. Uh, Admiral, clearly we've been uh, relatively close to military action uh, in recent months anyway. What percentage chance would you say that even those stealth attacks would take place in the coming weeks? I'd say at this stage there's a 10 to 20 percent chance there would be covert action of some kind. Certainly there will be those around the president who are saying, look, you've got to respond. I mean, if you look at this drumbeat of escalation from Iran, um, at some point there has to be an international response to an attack on the international energy system. Um, but I'd still call that in the 10 percent range, maybe 20 percent. I think the odds are still quite high that uh, cooler heads will prevail here. That The key, however, is Iran is not going to stop this behavior until there's some kind of a renegotiation of an agreement because the sanctions are really hurting them. And the fact that Iran has taken as, as dramatic a step as this attack will indeed push the Europeans toward the U.S. position. I don't think this is good uh, tactics or perhaps even worse strategy by the Iranians. So, so you're in Riyadh. So tell us a little bit about the reaction there. And I mean, this is a strike at the heart of Saudi Arabia's oil industry and how you expect leadership to respond. Um, everybody I encounter here, and I've been having a, a series of, uh, of pretty senior meetings, um, is very resolute. Uh, they're very measured. They are still continuing to try and build the case. Um, I think there's little doubt here that the Iranians are behind this, and I think you will see a response, but the Saudis will want to do that very much in concert, not only with their, uh, their own alliance structure here in the Gulf, but with the United States, uh, and I think that, that that is why we're going to take a couple of days to really put those options together, examine the evidence. We, we really want to have a tightly suitcased uh, presentation to make if we're going to take dramatic action. Uh, Admiral, to what extent has this attack uh, exposed Saudi weakness uh, at key uh, sites, whether military or, or oil related? And uh, do you think there's going to be more attacks that they can't defend? I think it exposes a, a, a very significant weakness in global energy. I mean, I, I would say really this could happen to any nation that has enemies. And, and frankly, it's not going to be big ballistic missiles that are attributable. It's going to be a new kind of strategic triad of cyber attacks, drone attacks, and possibly special forces. Those three things, I don't think any nation is particularly well prepared to defend itself against. And I think you'll see a lot of capitals uh, scrambling to look at this and to think about better defensive systems against those three things. The Saudis are very well defended against conventional attack, very well defended against ballistic missiles, uh, but not so much against this. And they're in the same boat in that regard as almost any other nation. Admiral, thanks for joining us. What a pleasure. Let's uh, hope we have a better topic next time. Absolutely. Uh, from Admiral Savridis, thanks for joining us. Still to come, we'll have much more on today's oil moves and the impact of the energy sector when we speak with Continental Resources CEO Harold Hamm. Plus, opioid maker Purdue Pharma filing for bankruptcy following thousands of lawsuits against the company. We'll tell you what Purdue's chairman said about the move and how the sector is reacting next. And as we had to break, here's a check on our data tracker today. Soft numbers out of China over the weekend. Industrial output growth slowing to its lowest level in 18 years. And in the U.S., the Empire State Manufacturing Index missing estimates by a point coming in at 2.0 in September. Dow's down 115 points, 45 minutes till the close. We'll be right back. This CNBC program. For people who want to feel happier. 
stronger, fitter, get further, faster, better. For people who want to, but don't always manage to. It doesn't matter how you want to do it, who you want to do it with. It matters that you want to. Virgin Active. We'll find a way for you. Join in September and get 15% off each month on 12-month memberships. Visit virginactive.co.uk. Participating gyms. Terms and conditions apply. One in two people believe they should check their work email on holiday. One in three believe it's okay to eat a colleague's lunch. And one in 14 believe it's okay to steal loo roll from work. People believe all sorts of strange things. Some people believe that insurance companies try to avoid paying claims. But last year, Zurich paid 99% of insurance claims made by their UK customers. Zurich, an insurance company you can believe in. To find out more, visit zurich.co.uk slash 99. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. Brexit will bring changes that affect businesses in many ways particularly if you buy from EU suppliers, sell to EU customers, provide services to EU clients, and receive customer data from other businesses in the EU. Businesses need to prepare. Find out how at gov.uk slash Brexit. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. To advertise the McCafe range from McDonald's, we could use a deep voiceover. Like this. They describe our coffee using words like robust and intense, but say very slowly and with an echo, robust, 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 intense, intense, intense. We could do all that. But we don't. What we do is use freshly ground Arabica beans and organic milk. McCafe, great tasting coffee. Simple. <laughs> do you remember? Here at Tesco, we're still celebrating 100 years of great value with even more great prices that take you back. Like our perfectly ripe Tesco mango, from £1 to just 59p, all this week at Tesco. Selected stores excludes express, subject to availability, or friends 30th of September. You don't just live in one room, so why should you Wi-Fi? With Sky Broadband's Wi-Fi guarantee, you'll get Wi-Fi in every room or money back. Perfect for food shopping in the bedroom, gaming in your PJs in the lounge, or streaming sci-fi movies in the kitchen. Get Sky's super-fast broadband and Wi-Fi guarantee. £32 a month for 18 months with 1995 setup. Search Sky Broadband. Sky Fiber Areas, Sky Kit required. Refund or boost component of subscription paid during current minimum term up to date of claim. Minimum 3 megabits per second or money back. Prices may change during minimum term. See sky.com slash guarantee. Opioid maker Purdue Pharma filing for bankruptcy protection over the weekend as it faces thousands of lawsuits related to the opioid crisis. CNBC's David Faber spoke earlier with Purdue chairman Steve Miller. He joins us now with more. Hi, David. Hey, Wilfred, that's right. Steve Miller is a long-time hand when it comes to restructuring, uh, having uh, also helmed AIG, for example, uh, more than 10 years ago as it restructured itself during the financial crisis. He's been at uh, Purdue about a year, and this morning was the big news that they've been preparing for for some time, namely the company files for bankruptcy, and equally important, or perhaps even more so, uh, they offer a proposed, or at least what they call a principal agreement, uh, on the landmark opioid litigation settlement. They've got 24 states that have signed on. Now, two previously have also settled with Purdue, but there are 24 state AGs or 24 states that either oppose this current settlement or haven't been heard from uh, one way or the other. And, of course, the key question is whether this settlement will actually stick. Uh, involved in it is about $10 billion of value they say will go towards addressing the opioid crisis through the bankruptcy, the restructuring of Purdue, and then the reestablishment of the company, which will exist essentially to help fund um, things to treat people who have opioid addiction. Uh, for example, doses, uh, millions of doses, tens of millions of opioid overdose reversal and addiction treatment medications at no or low cost. One provision of the deal. But having heard from a number of AGs today, there does seem to be a focus on the Sackler family, of course, the founders uh, of Purdue, who while contributing at least $3 billion to this settlement, seemingly it's not enough for many AGs out there who say they want more. I did ask Mr. Miller, well, what about the Sacklers? And did you negotiate hard to try to get them to give as much as they possibly could? Over the last year, have been completely transparent with the plaintiffs and have shown them every penny that went from the company to the family. Period. Full stop. What the family then did with the money 
is you know, not our business as the Purdue company. It is what the family does, and the family is scattered all over the world, so it's not surprising that uh, there may have been transfers, but that's not our issue Understood. as Purdue. He's talking there about recent reports of perhaps as much as a billion dollars worth of wire transfers from the Sacklers outside of the country. That was something unearthed by uh, the New York AG, Letitia James. And so this will continue, but from first Mr. Miller's point of view, uh, Sarah and Wilf, he says it's a fork in the road. You can either keep litigating with us, at which point we're just going to continue to go through resources that otherwise will be applied immediately towards the crisis at hand. I was just wondering, David, what the bankruptcy filing means for this next chapter. I mean, for a company that's facing, what, 2,600, I'm reading, government and other entity lawsuits against it, whether whether the bankruptcy filing is any sort of line in the sand or this is just going to completely haunt them for years and years. Well, no. I mean, the idea here, Sarah, is that you actually get this universal settlement. They have proposed it uh, this morning, uh, saying they've already got that agreement with those 24 states. And it is their hope that over time, more of the states, more of the plaintiffs and litigants are going to join in the settlement, understanding, at least from Mr. Miller's point of view, that fighting will only diminish the potential returns that actually could be used by the states that are hardest hit by the opioid crisis. So that's the route they're going. Like, yeah. It sounds like the AGs are, aren't exactly signing on with this settlement. Well, that's the key question. I did ask yeah. him as well, well, how many do you need in order to get approval by the bankruptcy court? He said, well, we need a majority. 24 is not quite enough, perhaps, but he wasn't clear on what number constitutes, and it's complicated, what number would constitute enough for a, for a bankruptcy judge to say, I sign off on this and you're all good. David, thank you very much. Sure thing. We've got a news alert uh, on another state cracking down on vaping, and Sue Herrera has the details for us. Hi, Sue. Hello, Wilf. Indeed, I do. Uh, California's Governor Gavin Newsom just signed an executive order directing the California Department of Public Health to launch a $20 million statewide digital and social media public awareness campaign to educate uh, the youth, young adults, and adults about the uh, perceived uh, problems with vaping. He also announced that he just signed uh, a bill, SB 39, that will tighten the requirements uh, placed on retailers in terms of stricter age verification, very similar to what happens when you go to buy liquor or wine in California. They want to see your ID, but apparently that it's a little looser in California, and now that's going to change because the governor just signed SB 39, which tightens the age requirements on vaping. And, of course, it follows New York's decision yesterday. So back to you guys. All right, Sue, thank you. And don't miss CNBC's documentary, Vaporized, America's e-cigarette addiction on this topic. It's tonight, 7 p.m. Eastern. We've got about 36 minutes left of trade. Let's send it over to Mike Santoli for today's market dashboards. Hi, Mike. Hi, Sarah. Or uh, I guess I'll say hello again, because that's where we're going to start with the dashboard. You know, crude oil uh, is up a lot today, but really just returned to a recent level. We'll take a look at some of the relationships with oil and stocks here. And then good times roll. They continue to roll in the high-yield credit market. That's probably a good thing for stocks. We'll take a look at that, too. And then uh, shaking it up, we're seeing a little more evidence of that really aggressive rotation that we were tracking all last week. Uh, and then finally, uh, Chancy Rendezvous. Is the dollar getting to a critical point uh, on the charts? We'll take a look at all that. So hello again. This is the ratio of the Dow Jones Industrial Average to the price of a barrel of crude oil. Now, there's no real-world uh, dynamic going on here. You can't buy oil with Dow points, but it does show you that we've basically been in a trading range for years with this relationship. You see this big spike. This is when oil was crashing uh, and then the market came back. But really, this is the latest move with oil prices going up and the Dow really absorbing it relatively well. By the way, if you go back into the early 80s, this was under You wanted on the right? unstoppable, so unbeaten, really unrivaled number one network? Well, who says he can't? Really part of the reason that the market Get unlimited. Uh, pretty, um, pretty even well, more. about what's going on. With you want it on the, the unstoppable, unbeaten, unrivaled number one network? We're nothing yet out of the range that we've seen either in oil prices or oil relative to the market. 
Mike Santoli, thank you. That's well, sort of what's happening today, at this right? hour. Yeah. Now U.S. Health producer. Secretary Alex Azar. It, it doesn't hurt us as we wonder what's much, happening right? at this hour. It does, it does. U.S. Health economy, Secretary Alex Azar has called on way. the Tanzanian well, we government totally to release the lab results That's correct. Of a so there's a couple things that work here. Number one is the energy -like complex symptoms. is not as big a deal in our markets as they were 10 or 15 years ago. And secondly, you're absolutely right in pointing it out. We are producing a lot of oil so we can take this shock. We couldn't in 1973 when they did the embargo and all of a sudden we were out of oil and we had long gas lines. I remember my dad sitting in line. Uh, but today, yeah, it's a much different picture. So what we're talking about at the top, the resiliency of the market with a shock like this. At 62 bucks for WTI as well, is the consumer still able to be as strong and resilient as it's been? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if we were to see a, an appreciable uh, uptick from there, then they'd start making a little bit of a you know calculation with their own home budget. Uh, but again, something Sarah and I were talking about before is I see the increase, this event, and perhaps the increase in the price of oil as a deflationary investment or deflationary effect when people start making decisions about where they're going to put the dollars that they have. All right. Okay, thank you. We'll talk more with you after the break. Uber and Lyft upgraded today at HSBC with the firm also cutting its price target on both stocks. We'll get word on the street calls on those next. And later, Peloton hitting a speed bump as it heads towards an IPO. We'll speak with the CEO of the National Music Publishers Association about why his organization just doubled its claims against the fitness startup. We're back in a couple minutes. Don't go anywhere. For farmers here. For people who want to feel happier, stronger, fitter, Get further, faster, better. For people who want to, but don't always manage to. It doesn't matter how you want to do it, who you want to do it with. It matters that you want to. Virgin Active. We'll find a way for you. Join in September and get 15% off each month on 12-month memberships. Visit virginactive.co.uk. Participating gyms. Terms and conditions apply. One in two people believe they should check their work email on holiday. One in three believe it's okay to eat a colleague's lunch. And one in 14 believe it's okay to steal loo roll from work. People believe all sorts of strange things. Some people believe that insurance companies try to avoid paying claims. But last year, Zurich paid 99% of insurance claims made by their UK customers. Zurich, an insurance company you can believe in. To find out more, visit zurich.co.uk slash 99. This one shouldn't take long. Of course, if it had a cover, I might not be bothered. Can't see what's under there. And then they'd have chained the back wheel. It would have taken me much longer, especially if the chain's off the ground. Makes it harder to cut. This one doesn't even have a lock on the front. So, in the time I've been talking to you, I've nicked it. Over 9,000 scooters and motorbikes were stolen in London last year. Lock your bike, chain the rear wheel, and cover it to make it harder to steal. Lock, chain, cover. The Met Police. Do you remember? Here at Tesco, we're still celebrating 100 years of great value, with even more great prices that take you back. Like our Tesco pineapple, from £1 to just 59p, all this week at Tesco. Selected stores excludes Express, subject to availability off Rens 30th of September. This Sunday, it's West Ham v Man United and Chelsea v Liverpool in two outstanding fixtures. And with Now TV, you can watch both games live for a one-off payment of just 9 99 Hold on, they're checking with VAR. That's confirmed, it's 9 99 That's the result we were looking for. So, to only pay for the games that matter to you, grab a Now TV Sky Sports Day Pass. Search Now TV Sports. 18 plus, content streamed by internet, full terms apply. Welcome back to Closing Bell Half Hour till the close. Time now for Word on the Street. HSBC upgrading Uber and Lyft, both to buy. But the firm did lower price targets on both stocks to $44 from $49 a share for Uber, $62 from $67 for Lyft. HSBC says regulatory concerns surrounding both companies are already priced into the stocks. The weak upgrade. Lowering the price target at the <laughs> yeah. same point. I knew you were going to complain about that. Yeah, it that. drives me mad. Baird initiating Zoom video with an outperform rating and a $100 price target. The firm says the Zoom phone is a new frontier in replacing legacy phone system and sees upside potential. And Stiefel downgrading Aurora Cannabis to sell the firm citing near-term outlook as well as negative investment sentiment for the sector. Um, Keith, on the Uber and Lyft ones, I mean, they've pulled back significantly. Interesting timing to get an upgrade just as we're getting sort of the peak fears around WeWork's IPO. Do you think they've been linked, the two, the share prices come down 
in lieu of the the problems of that potential IPO? Well, some something like that is going on with the with the uh, unicorns of that era, right? Everybody's now very much gun shy watching what's happened on those. But if you if you read the note closely from HSBC on both Uber and Lyft. He's really talking about, what he talks about in there is the free optionality that you get with things like Uber Eats and Uber Freight and other things like that. So the, so in their view, the investors for both Uber and Lyft are really just looking at it as a ride-hailing company and kind of ignoring all these other businesses. Mm-hmm. The public markets will take that for so long. We saw that with Amazon 20 years ago where Jeff Bezos kept saying, no, I'm more than just a bookseller, just watch. And he, and he paid off and they're willing to deal with the losses for years and years. The question will be, will the Uber and Lyft investors continue to come into the stock, support it, while we wait for Uber Eats and Uber Freight and some of the other things really to take I really wanted to ask you about the Aurora downgrade because you have liked Canopy Growth as a last chance trade. I have. Sentiment on the group overall right now seems to be not as hot. Yeah, it's a... How do you distinguish? Well, I think what happened with with Cannabis is 2017 when all these companies came to the market is everybody saw this as the next gold rush and suddenly... Everybody was going to be making hemp rope and hemp paper, and we were going to have medicinal and recreational products all over the world. That just hasn't come to the fore like any industry. has to grow. has to mature. The big difference between Aurora and Canopy Growth, though, I think is Constellation Brands. So Constellation Brands has basically put a put under the Canopy Growth stock by giving them, by de-risking the capital needs of these companies. That's something Aurora hasn't gotten to. So what they're saying is that they're... These companies are sucking a lot of capital right now, and unless they have a big-time consumer partner, it's going to be very difficult for them to access the capital markets. Uh, we have got uh, just 28 minutes, 27 minutes left to go of trade. We're down 150 points on the Dow. Here are the key things driving the action. Oil prices and energy stocks spiking on concerns of supply disruptions following a strike on key Saudi oil facilities over the weekend. Those geopolitical tensions have the rest of the market on risk-off mode. Equities broadly lower, gold higher, yields slumping. And global growth concerns back in the headlines on the back of weak economic data from China. Time now to get a CNBC News update with Sue Herrera. Hi, Sue. Hello again, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Here's what's happening at this hour. Another move against vaping. Officials in Illinois are now moving towards a proposal to ban flavored e-cigarettes in Chicago. Mayor Lori Lightfoot joining Senator Dick Durbin to highlight the problem of vaping products being aimed at children. We've got to convince students first that it's a bad idea to vape. We've got to convince their parents that it's not a harmless cloud of smoke around their heads. And we've got to take into consideration today that 5 million high school students across the United States are using vaping products. One firefighter is dead and seven others injured after a gas explosion leveled a building in a small town in Maine. Firefighters responded to a report of a gas smell this morning, and while they were investigating the scene, the building exploded. Multiple homes in the area were also damaged. New Orleans quarterback Drew Brees is expected to be out for six weeks after injuring his thumb Sunday in Los Angeles. He tore a ligament in his right thumb as his throwing hand hit the hand of the Rams defender Aaron Donald. The Saints went on to lose the game 27-9. to A lot of injuries for this early in the season. You are up to date. That's the news update this hour. Guys, I'll send it back downtown to you. All right, Sue, thank you. Mm-hmm. Coming up on a daily today. Who do you want to hear from? Well, we've got the Chevron CEO, Michael Worth, joining us to weigh in on the spike in oil, the impact of this weekend's attacks on the energy industry, one of the largest energy companies that is also the leader right now in the Dow. You cannot miss it. Dow's down 145. We'll be right back. CNBC Sector Sword is sponsored by Sector Spider ETFs. Sector Spider ETFs. Visit us on the web at sectorspiders.com. For people who want to feel happier, stronger, fitter, get further, faster, better. For people who want to, but don't always manage to. It doesn't matter how you want to do it, who you want to do it with. It matters that you want to. Virgin Active. We'll find a way for you. Join in September and get 15% off each month on 12-month memberships. Visit virginactive.co.uk. Participating gyms. Terms and conditions apply. This one shouldn't take long. Of course, if it had a cover, I might not be bothered. Can't see what's under there. And then they'd have chained the back wheel. Would have taken me much longer, especially if the chain's off the ground. Makes it harder to cut. 
this one doesn't even have a lock on the front. So, in the time I've been talking to you, I've nicked it. Over 9,000 scooters and motorbikes were stolen in London last year. Lock your bike, chain the rear wheel, and cover it to make it harder to steal. Lock, chain, cover. The Met Police. One in two people believe they should check their work email on holiday. One in three believe it's okay to eat a colleague's lunch. And one in 14 believe it's okay to steal loo roll from work. People believe all sorts of strange things. Some people believe that insurance companies try to avoid paying claims. But last year, Zurich paid 99% of insurance claims made by their UK customers. Zurich, an insurance company you can believe in. To find out more, visit zurich.co.uk slash 99. We could play epic music. Or we could speak in an overdramatic tone. Or even set off fireworks. But that's just not smarty. Instead, we let our offer do the talking. Right now, you can grab 25% off our unlimited data SIM. That's just 18 75 a month with no speed restrictions, no credit check, and no long contract to tie you in. Now that's Smarty. Just search Smarty Mobile and switch today. It's easy. Offer available for a limited time only. See smarty.co.uk for terms. Get smart, get savvy, and get saving this month at Tesco Mobile with some of our best ever prices on the latest phones. Like the Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus, now only $34.49 a month. A huge saving of £144. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Ends 29th of September. S10 Plus savings based on £4 per month. 36-month credit agreement. 24-month usage agreement. Subject to state. Base policy apply. See tescomobile.com slash terms. Welcome back. 22 minutes uh, left of trade. Let's get over to Mike uh, for today's second installment of the dashboard. Mike. Well, you know, the good times continue to roll among credit investors. The high-yield market has remained very firm, kind of underwriting the equity market strength and really ratifying this rally we've seen uh, lately. I like to look at the relationship between the high yield bond ETF and this uh, 7 to 10 year treasury ETF. It's a roughly equivalent in terms of maturity. This is a proxy for risk appetite in credit markets and basically the junk bond spread, even though it's not exactly the spread. So uh, the orange is the treasury uh, ETF. You see it really outperformed. As we all know, yields went down a lot in August. That is now reversed to some degree and High yield has remained very, very firm in the face of this yield push higher. By the way, the uh, oil price uh, spike today is also a benefit in some ways to the high yield index because you have a lot of very indebted energy companies that basically the high price is a windfall and it makes them, uh, you know, have better liquidity and, and better credit profile. So this right now uh, more or less says that the stock market rally is probably on decent footing unless uh, this changes, guys. All right, Mike, thank you. Three J.P. Morgan metals traders have been charged with alleged market manipulation. Wilfred, you've been digging into this story all day. Yeah, so two current and one former J.P. Morgan precious metals traders have each been charged with alleged spoofing, market manipulation, and fraud between 2008 and 2016. Spoofing involves placing orders with the intention to cancel them before they can be executed in order to benefit other existing trades. Okay. Michael Novak is a managing director and heads the Global Precious Metals Trading Division, while Greg Smith is an executive director. Both were put on lead by the firm. Christopher Jordan is a former executive director. Novak's attorney said today it's truly regrettable that the DOJ decided to go forward with the prosecution of Mike Novak, who has done nothing wrong. We look forward to representing him at trial and expect him to be fully exonerated. The Justice Department is conducting multiple criminal investigations into big banks with the cooperation of traders who have pleaded guilty to spoofing-related crimes. In June, Bank of America Merrill Lynch settled uh, with the DOJ and CFTC for a combined $36.5 million. As part of the terms, the firm admitted it was at fault for two former traders who allegedly manipulated the precious metals market. J.P. Morgan has not settled, nor pleaded guilty, nor made any specific comment, but there have also been no charges made against the bank itself. Uh, the share price not really reacting, uh, unsurprisingly, in relation to this, Sarah, we watch now for further developments. I was just going to say, in the, in the context of scandals and issues, mm. we're, how, how big of a deal is this? The bank's not been charged specifically, though there are more traders involved for them than have been for Bank of America, who ultimately then pleaded guilty. That's the swing factor where we're at at the moment. But uh, as we uh, stated, these are only allegations to individuals at this stage, and the bank itself hasn't been charged. So uh, we need to see how it plays out from here. But one to watch. Okay. 
Just a spoofing. Exactly. Uh, with uh, just 19 minutes left of trade, we're down 152 points uh, on the Dow. Energy stocks getting a boost, though, following a spike in oil prices on the back of that uh, attack on Saudi facilities. We'll dive into the moves with Chevron CEO Michael Worth. That's coming up. You don't want to miss it. Flight number four. For people who want to feel happier, stronger, fitter, get further, faster, better. For people who want to, but don't always manage to. It doesn't matter how you want to do it, who you want to do it with. It matters that you want to. Virgin Active. We'll find a way for you. Join in September and get 15% off each month on 12-month memberships. Visit virginactive.co.uk. Participating gyms. Terms and conditions apply. One in two people believe they should check their work email on holiday. One in three believe it's okay to eat a colleague's lunch. And one in 14 believe it's okay to steal loo roll from work. People believe all sorts of strange things. Some people believe that insurance companies try to avoid paying claims. But last year, Zurich paid 99% of insurance claims made by their UK customers. Zurich, an insurance company you can believe in. To find out more, visit zurich.co.uk slash 99. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. Brexit will bring changes that affect businesses in many ways, particularly if you buy from EU suppliers, sell to EU customers, provide services to EU clients, and receive customer data from other businesses in the EU. Businesses need to prepare. Find out how at gov.uk slash Brexit. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. Welcome, Mr. Jones. We have you and Mrs. Jones booked in for the anniversary package with the aromatic rose petal bath and the couple's massage. When will your wife be joining us? She couldn't get out of work, so I bought Brian from football. All right. Like getting your money's worth? Enjoy the delicious bacon double cheeseburger. Just one ninety nine from the McDonald's saver menu. <laughs> from 10.30am, price and participation may vary. Should we go halves? I'll get this. Let me just get my card. Which was in my pocket. Um... You can't control awkward first dates. But if you temporarily misplace your Visa debit card, you can freeze and unfreeze it on our mobile banking app. Feel in control every day. Lloyds Bank, by your side. You can only freeze some transaction types. T's and C's apply. Get smart, get savvy and get saving this month at Tesco Mobile with some of our best ever prices on the latest phones. Like the Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus, now only $34.49 a month. A huge saving of £144. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Ends 29th of September. S10 Plus savings based on £4 per month. 36-month credit agreement. 24-month usage agreement. Subject to status phase. Policy apply. See tescomobile.com slash terms. Hi, this is Brian Weber, host of NFL First and Goal every Sunday, kicking off at 1 Eastern, only on TuneIn Premium. Be sure to listen this Sunday for the ultimate football fan experience, featuring seven hours of commercial-free coverage of every scoring play around the NFL. General Motors sinking today amid a massive strike of nearly 50,000 United auto workers against the company. Phil LeBeau has the latest for us from Detroit. Hey, Phil. Hey, Wolf, a couple of headlines coming out of the White House regarding the UAW GM strike. The president says that he would like to see the strike resolved rather quickly, and he has a strong relationship with the auto workers. Interesting comment, given the fact that when we've talked with auto workers here, most of them have said, I'm not going to comment on the president, but I do not get a sense at all that there is a lot of love between at least the UAW workers that I've worked with and President Trump. In terms of the negotiations, which did resume today between General Motors and the United Auto Workers, a lot of discussion about what type of job offers GM has made. Now, the company did come out yesterday and say, look, we are offering at least 5,400 jobs. I also know from talking with sources familiar with the negotiations that General Motors might, and they're not saying it's official, but they might put an electric pickup truck in this plant here that I'm standing in front of. This is the Hamtramck plant in Detroit. They may also agree to have the UAW run a electric vehicle battery plant in the Lordstown area. That wouldn't replace the Lordstown plant, but it would be jobs for the UAW in that area. Guys, as you take a look at shares of General Motors, keep in mind that the stock, while it dropped as much as 4% today, most analysts believe you're looking at a stock that is likely to feel an impact only after a couple of weeks. Like, it have to be extended well beyond a couple of weeks 
then you might see an extended uh, impact in terms of what happens with the stock. But if this gets resolved in the next few days or even the next week and a half or so, most believe that GM will be able to weather the storm. It'll take a little bit of a hit, but not much. Guys? Got it. Phil, thank you. Phil LeBeau. Energy stocks are soaring right now after a coordinated attack on two of the world's largest crude processing facilities in Saudi Arabia that knocked out almost 6% of global oil production. Just moments ago, President Trump saying it looks like Iran was responsible for those attacks. And Secretary of State Mike Pompeo will be going to the region soon. This has been the administration's line. Joining us now to discuss the fallout is Paul Sankey, oil analyst at Mizuho. So how do you begin to think about the impact for U.S. oil producers, much many of which are soaring double digits today? Uh, well, you know, not wanting to be... Uh dancing on someone's grave, but it's obviously a positive for the U.S. producers. We have the lowest cost of capital in the Permian, tremendous oil reserves, now the biggest producing oil field in the world. And we always thought that being a major producer in Texas would be probably a pretty good thing to be. Uh, we we're absolutely shocked by what's happened in Saudi Arabia. I can't tell you. And now we're thinking, okay, who are they going to attack? Right, that's the situation we're in. What, why so shocked? Because you thought they'd be able to defend themselves or you never thought that the Iranians, if indeed it was them, would take things to this level? Both. Both. I mean, we thought that the facilities were triple redundant, in the middle of nowhere, giant in scale, uh, very, very difficult to shut down. But they've been shut down. So, you know, that's point one. And as, as, as far as, you know, what happens next, we've obviously got an ongoing situation with the Houthis. But everybody's clearly saying this came from Iran. So, so, you know, what are you going to do about it? If you do see a Saudi response against Iran, what would that mean for the price of oil? It'll be horrific. I mean, it's it's going to it's potentially a full-scale war situation in the Middle East. Obviously, well, we always use this rhetoric that uh, the U.S. is not a swing producer. I mean, who can make up the the shortfall if it persists from the Middle East and Saudi in particular for an extended period of time? Well, we've been big proponents of not raising capex for higher prices so we're trying to get these companies to actually generate some returns uh, at the moment what you're going to see is a u.s government response in all likelihood depending on how long the outage lasts because we really don't know how long we're going to be out out here with this loss from saudi but obviously we're looking at the spr we're looking at the iea and they're not doing anything right now we don't want U.S. EMPs to go out and double up the CapEx but budgets. You, That's like not their job. you, like many on Wall Street, have not been fans of the EMP companies. It's, it's the worst performing sector year to date. I mean, is this a total game changer for you? On how you yeah, we upgraded vastly the energy this morning because we want to get along the Permian immediately. Like, no questions asked. So some people think, you know, is this going to be a transient effect? Our view is you've structurally raised the risk premium in oil. And as a result, you've structurally raised the value of Permian. And so we upgraded past the energy alongside our other names like EOG and the other top Permian names that we love. Paul, thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot. Great to see you. Uh, President Trump speaking moments ago with the Crown Prince of Bahrain. Let's listen in. We're always going to be with them. And I know they're always going to be with us. We have a tremendous relationship militarily, but we have also a tremendous economic relationship, trade. Uh, and we're going to be discussing all of those things. We'll certainly be discussing what took place over the last two days in Saudi Arabia. Absolutely. And uh, we'll be discussing the Middle East. But our relationship has never been stronger than it is right now, and I think that is largely based on the relationship that we have. So I look forward to having our discussion. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. You. It's thank a great pleasure much. to be here. Please. Would you like to say something? Well, I would like to say thank the President for receiving me and my delegation uh, here today. I'm here to convey the greetings of His Majesty and the people of Bahrain to strengthen the relationship, which is based on shared values, where they overlap, and uh, ideals. We primarily, as the President said, are going to focus on discussions related to security enhancement and trade enhancement. We signed today a agreement to purchase additional, or to purchase our first uh, Patriot missile battery systems, right. and it couldn't have come at a better time. Good timing. Absolutely. And we, we seek to strengthen America's ability to trade with the world, and we have some concrete ideas on how we can do that. Well, thank you very much. Thank I look you, forward Mr. to the day and spending time with you. And thank you all very much. I'll be doing a news conference outside in a little while, just prior to the trip. We're going to Mexico and to other places uh, for two and a half days, and many of you will be with us, and I look forward to that. But. In particular, I look forward to our meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. President.
evidence, proof that Iran was behind the attack. Well, it's looking that way. We'll have some pretty good, uh, uh, we're having some very strong studies done, but it's certainly looking that way at this moment, and uh, we'll let you know. As soon as we find out definitively, we'll let you know, but it does look that way. Do I want war? I don't want war with anybody. I'm somebody that would like not to have war. We have the strongest military in the world. We've spent more than a trillion and a half dollars in the last short period of time on our military. Nobody's even come close. We have the best equipment in the world. We have the best missiles. And as you say, you just bought the Patriot system. There's nothing even close. Uh, But uh, no, I don't want war with anybody, but we're prepared more than anybody. Uh, Two and a half years ago, I will tell you, it was not the same thing. And with what we've done, we've totally rebuilt our military in so many different ways, but we've rebuilt it. And uh, there's nobody that has the F-35. We have the best fighter jets, the best rockets, the best missiles, the best equipment. Uh, But with all of that being said, we'd certainly like to avoid it. What are the options, Mr. President? What are the options if not a military? Well, we have a lot of options, but uh, I'm not looking at options right now. We want to find definitively who did this. Uh, We're dealing with Saudi Arabia. We're dealing with the crown prince and so many other of your neighbors. And we're all talking about it together. We'll see what happens. Is it the responsibility of Saudi Arabia to... Say it. Well, I have no meeting scheduled. I know they want to meet. I know they're not doing well as a country. Iran has got a lot of problems right now that uh, two and a half years ago... And even a little bit more than that, when I came in, it's hard to believe. It's almost three years. But two and a half to three years ago, they were causing a lot of trouble. And we'll see what happens. But uh, we'll let you know definitively. Or there, as you know, there are ways to uh, see definitively where they came from. And we have all of those ways. And that's being checked out right now. Well, you know, there were always conditions. Because the conditions, if you look at it, the sanctions are not going to be taken off. So if the sanctions, that's a condition. So, you know, that's why the press misreported it. Uh, The biggest thing you can talk about are the sanctions, and the sanctions are massive. There's never been sanctions put on a country like that. And I think they have a tremendous future, but not the way they're behaving. We'll see what happens in terms of this attack. Uh, Secretary Pompeo and others will be going over to Saudi Arabia at some point to discuss what they feel they're going to make a statement fairly soon. Uh, but they also know something that most people don't know as to where it came from, who did it, and we'll be able to find that out and figure that out very quickly. We pretty much already know. Mr. President, you said the United States is prepared for war? Say it. You said the United States is prepared for war? The United States is more prepared than any country in the history of, of in any history, if we have to go that way. Uh, as to whether or not we go that way, we'll see. We have to find out definitively who did it. Uh, we have to speak to Saudi Arabia. They have to have a lot of. Uh, they have to have a lot in the game also, and you know they're willing to do that. Uh, I think everybody knows they're willing to do that. So we'll be meeting with Saudi Arabia. We'll be talking to Saudi Arabia. We'll be talking to UAE and many of the neighbors out there that we're very close friends with. We're also talking to. Europe, a lot of the countries that we're dealing with, whether it's France, Germany, etc., uh, talking to a lot of different folks, and we're figuring out what they think. But I will tell you, that was a very large attack, and it could be met with an attack many, many times larger very easily by our country. But we're going to find out who definitively did it first. Can we clarify, Mr. President? So you said that you think that Iran is responsible for the attack. Do you think that I, the attack I didn't say that. I, why do you, you say said, that? I said, said that, that we think we know who it was, but I didn't say anybody. I but you, you uh, certainly it would look to most like it was Iran, but I did not say it the way you said. Go yeah, ahead. Do you think it was launched from Iran? Well, you're going to find out in great detail in the very near future. We have the exact locations of just about everything. You're going to find out at the right time, but it's too early to tell you that now. Well, they haven't risen very much, and we have these strategic oil reserves, which are massive, and we can uh, release a little bit of that. And uh, other countries, including Bahrain, but other countries can be a little bit more generous with the oil, and you'd bring it right down. So, no, that's not a problem. It went up $5. And uh, that, that is not a problem. Mr. President, Mr. President, and you have to remember, we're now the largest uh, producer of oil and gas in the world. So 
And a lot of people in the old days, and this happened over the last very short period of time, uh, were number one in the world by far. Yes, you right? are. By far. So uh, I never want to be benefited that way. But the fact is, uh, there are those that say we benefit. I don't view that as a benefit, but we are certainly uh, we take in more money than anybody else from energy, not even close. Mr. Mr. President, do you still think it's the responsibility of the Saudis to defend themselves? No, oh, I think I think it is certainly the responsibility of them to do a big a big deal of their defense. Certainly, uh, I also think it's the responsibility of the Saudis to, uh, if somebody like us, which are the ones, uh, are going to help them, uh, they, I know that monetarily will be much involved in paying for that. This is something that's much different than other presidents would mention, John, but the fact is that the Saudis uh, are going to have a lot of uh, involvement in this if we decide to do something. Uh, they'll be very much involved, and that includes payment, and they understand that fully. But they're going to be, uh, look, they're very upset. They're very angry. Uh, they know pretty much what we know. They know pretty much where they came from, and we're looking for the final checkpoints, and I think you won't be surprised to see who did it. We'll be discussing it, yeah, we'll be discussing it. Well, we're going to see what, I mean, it's the elections on Tuesday, so, uh, like, tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> so you have an election tomorrow, so I, I would think it would be afterwards, Okay. But we, uh, you do have an election, big, big election tomorrow in Israel, and uh, that'll be a very interesting outcome. It's going to be close. It's going to be a close election. But I mean, after the chairman can't invite you to North Korea and that I don't want to comment on that. Okay. The relationship is very good, but I don't want to comment on Would that. Would you be willing to go? To I just don't think it's appropriate for me to comment. Would you be willing to go to North Korea? Probably not. I don't think it's ready. I don't think we're ready for that. I would do it sometime, at some time in a later future. Uh, and depending on what happens, I'm sure he'll love coming to the United States also. But uh, no, I don't think it's ready for that. I think we have a ways to go yet. you stand with the auto workers in the strike against you? Well, I have great relationship with the auto workers. I got tremendous numbers of votes from the auto workers. Uh, I don't want General Motors to be building plants outside of this country. As you know, they built many plants in China and Mexico, and I don't like that at all. Uh, my relationship has been very powerful with the auto workers, uh, not necessarily the top person or two, but the people that work uh, doing automobiles. Nobody's ever brought more uh, companies into the United States. You know, I have Japan and Germany, and many countries have been bringing car companies into the opening plants and expanding plants. and. Big things are happening in Ohio, including with Lordstown. The very positive things are happening. Uh, we have many plants that are either being renovated or expanded or built new right now in the United States. Many more than we've had for decades and decades. So nobody's been better to the auto workers than me. I'd like to see it work out. Uh, but I don't want General Motors building plants in China and Mexico. This was before my watch. And I don't think they'll be doing that. I don't think. I had uh, meetings with Mary Barra, the head of GM, and I don't want them leaving our country. I don't want a building in China. I don't want to build them in other countries. I don't want uh, these big, massive auto plants built in other countries. And I don't think they'll be doing that anymore. You know, General Motors makes most of its money in the United States. And it's too bad they spent billions and billions of dollars outside of the United States before I got here. Uh, one of the things very important in the USMCA, which we have to have approved for the, not only for the unions, for the auto workers, but for the farmers and for the manufacturers, for everybody. Everybody wants USMCA. It's very important, even more so now than it was two weeks ago. Uh, but people really want it. I'm sad to see the strike. Hopefully it's going to be a quick one. Mr. President, Mr. President um, has diplomacy been exhausted when it comes to issues of Iran? Diplomacy, has it been exhausted? No, it's never exhausted. In fact, uh, the Crown Prince can tell you, especially in your part of the world, it's never exhausted until the final 12 seconds. Is that right? That is correct. It, you never know what's going to happen. No, it's not exhausted. Nothing's exhausted. We'll see what happens. I think they would like to make a deal. I know they'd like to make a deal. They'd like to do it, but they'd like to do it on certain terms and conditions, and we won't do that. 
But at some point, it will work out, in my opinion. Uh, the, the problem was the deal that was signed by the previous administration was a disaster, which, by the way, would be expiring in a very short period of time also. So you, you really don't have a deal. You know, that deal was a very short-term deal. So they made a deal, but it was for a very short period of time. So that deal would be expiring very soon. Yes. Um, are, are you encouraging Israel and the Saudis to work together on this issue, particularly since they have Always. I encourage goal? everybody. I want everybody to work together. The Middle East is an interesting place. <laughs> they uh, historically have not been working together too well. But no, Israel is starting to work together with a lot of countries that you wouldn't have thought possible two years ago. Yes, Steve. Have you, you promised the Saudis that the U.S. will protect them? In no, I haven't. No, I haven't. I haven't promised the Saudis that. We have to sit down with the Saudis and work something out. And uh, the Saudis want very much for us to protect them. But I say, well, we have to work. That was an attack on Saudi Arabia. And uh, that wasn't an attack on us. But we would certainly help them. They've been a great ally. They spend $400 billion in our country over the last number of years. $400 billion. That's a million and a half jobs. Uh, and they're not ones that, unlike some countries, where they want terms. They want terms and conditions. They want to say, can we borrow the money at zero percent for the next 400 years? No. No, Saudi Arabia pays cash. They've helped us out from the standpoint of jobs and all of the other things. And they've actually helped us. I would call and I would say, listen, our oil prices, our gasoline's too high. you got to let more go. You know that. I would call the crown prince and I'd say, uh, you got to help us out. You got to get some more. And all of a sudden, the oil starts flowing and the gasoline prices are down. No other president can do that. No other president was able to do that. Or maybe they didn't try. But I've done it. So now they're under attack and we will work something out uh, with them. But they also know that, you know, I'm not looking to get into new conflict. But sometimes you have to. Mr. President, what's your message to Iran right now? Excuse me? What's your message to Iran right now? I think uh, I'll have a stronger message or maybe no message at all uh, when we get the final results of what we're looking at. But right now, it's too soon to say. There's plenty of time. You know, there's no rush. We'll all here, be here a long time. There's no rush. But I'll have a message, uh, whether it's a strong message or maybe no message at all, depending on the final results. How can you argue about the risk of an all-out war in the Middle East? I'm not concerned at all. You don't think that we're a step closer? No, I'm, I'm not. States? Personally, I'm not concerned at all. We have, we have military power the likes of which the world has never seen. I'm not concerned at all. I'd like to avoid it. You know, when I came here three years ago almost, General Mattis told me, sir, we're very low on ammunition. I said, that's a horrible thing to say. I'm not blaming him. I'm not blaming anybody. But that's what he told me. Because we were at a position where, with a certain country, I won't say which one, we may have had conflict. And he said to me, sir, uh, if you could, delay it, because we're very low on ammunition. And I said, you know what, General, I never want to hear that again from another general. No president should ever, ever hear that statement. We're low on ammunition. And we now have more ammunition, more missiles, more rockets, more tanks. More, we have more of everything that we've ever had before, more jet fighters. When I came here, 50 percent of our jet fighters didn't fly. You know that. And they were in bad shape. And now we have the best fighters in the world. Everybody wants to buy them. Are you buying our jet fighters? We are, sir. Which one? We have 16. That's great. Signed it here. You have good taste. Thank you. Sir. That's a great one. So uh, we are uh, very high on ammunition now. That's a story I've never told before. Breaking news. But we, had, we were very low. I, I could even say it stronger. I don't want to say no ammunition, but that gets a lot closer. Uh, I said, I never want to hear that again. And I never want another president of the United States to hear that again. Could you imagine as president when they say we're very low on ammunition? By the way, stronger than that but I'm not going to go there. That was what I was told. And I said, I never want to be on, in a position like that again. And he said, could you delay if we do something, sir? Could you delay it as we fill up? And that is what I inherited from the past administration. And in all fairness to President Obama, two administrations before President Obama. That's what I got stuck with. And we fixed it and we fixed it good. Uh, 
the crown prince understands 700 billion the next year 718 billion and the next year which is right now we just got approved 738 billion dollars and that's a lot of money even for bahrain right that's a lot of money that's a sir. lot even for bahrain and bahrain has a lot of money okay Mr. President, election coming up tomorrow how does that affect the timing of removing his peace plan? Well, we're going to have to see what happens, Steve. I just don't know. I can't tell you what's going to happen. I, I can make a prediction. I sort of have a feeling, but but uh, we're going to have to see what happens. That's a big election. That's one we're all going to be watching. You think that now will pull it out? Well, certainly he has a good chance, but it's a very, you know, it's a 50-50 election. A lot of people, if you look at the polls and everything else, it's going to be very close. So we'll see what happens. Polls, yeah. polls are often wrong. They now call for annexing all settlements in the West Bank. Is that something that your government would do? Yeah, I don't want to talk about that, but certainly it's something we uh, were told about that they'd like to do. But no, I don't want to be talking about that. It's President, too soon. Can you just kind of elaborate a little bit on why the decision was taken yesterday to release the strategic reserves? Why did you decide right away to well, do that? Well, just in case we ran a little bit low on oil, we have so much with the strategic reserves, plus... Uh, being the number one producer, we can fill them up very quickly, very, very quickly. And one of the things I'm doing also is I'm approving the pipelines in Texas. We have a tremendous pipeline system that's being held up by various agencies for a very good reason, for going through the normal process. And we're going to have to avoid the normal process because if we do that, Texas is a massive distributor, a massive producer of oil, far bigger than anybody would have even thought five years ago. So what I'm going to do is expedite the pipeline approvals. That will get us another 25% uh, energy, additional energy. I know this is exactly the opposite of the Democrats. They want to have wind, solar, and uh, I guess make-believe would be the third alternative, right? Uh, no, this is uh, something we have to do. We have the greatest wealth in the world, and we want to be able to capitalize on it, especially when it comes to safety. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. You talked about the urban agenda when you ran for president the first time. You went to Baltimore last year. Yeah. What are your plans for Baltimore? Cities like Baltimore, instead of pointing fingers, what are you trying to do to help the city rise up from the road infested place that you see? Well, I think what I've done for the inner cities is more than any president has done for a long time. We've created opportunity zones. In fact, I did that with Tim Scott, who you know very well, who's, I think, a tremendous guy. Uh, it was his initiative, and he came to see me. Uh, they're having a tremendously positive impact on the inner cities, including Baltimore, including a lot of other cities that you wouldn't necessarily think. Oakland, California, is an example. We're having tremendous success in the inner cities because of the opportunity zones. Uh, criminal justice reform, I was the one that got it. Nobody else. I mean, we had people that helped, but a group of extremely liberal Democrats came to the office and they said, we cannot get it. President Obama was unable to get it, as you know. Uh, President Bush, uh, they were all unable to get it, and I got it. And I got it with some very conservative senators and people that wanted it to happen. And nobody else could have done it. And it's sort of interesting because they don't like mentioning my name, although uh, I guess now people are understanding. But we got it. We got it done. We formed a coalition with some very conservative people, as you know, and some uh, people that are very far left. And we did a thing called criminal justice reform, something that nobody thought. The Crown Prince uh, has seen this. Nobody thought this could possibly happen. And I'm very proud of criminal justice reform. So we did that. We did the opportunity zones and a lot of other things. Our job numbers for African Americans are the best in history. You saw the new ones came out. They're even better than they were two months ago. Uh, Hispanic, the best in history. Asian, the best in history. Overall, they're phenomenal, the best in 51 years. And I think we'll soon be historic on that one, too. Uh, the economy is doing great, and that's the best thing I can do. Did you look at Baltimore when you flew over? Did you see? No, when I drove through, I looked at it. We flew over, but we also know you have some sections that uh, need a lot of help. And, you know, what people don't know, I had a great meeting with Elijah Cummings in this office very early in my tenure, and it was a meeting on drug prices. And I saw him get emotional talking about drug prices, seriously emotional. And I was really impressed. He cared about it. And I would certainly be willing to meet with uh, Elijah and other people if they'd like. But I saw 
the emotion and the feeling that he had for reducing drug prices. And we've worked hard and we've actually had the first year in 51 years where prices went down, but we can get them down much further if we can get the help from Congress. So I think we're going to do much lower drug prices over the next year. And I think that if Elijah Cummings would want help, uh, I am here. But I did see him at a moment that was actually, I thought, a very beautiful moment. I've talked about it often because I see the political rhetoric every once in a while. And I said, that's not the same guy I had in my office. That was a very caring man that wanted to see drug prices lower. And he, and he wanted that for the community, for his community. So I look forward to working with Elijah, but I look forward to working with a lot of people. But I think opportunity zones have been tremendous for the inner cities. And uh, criminal justice reform is something we're very proud of. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't think I have to do outside now, do I? Do I have to do outside? Can I go directly? <laughs> <laughs> Can I go directly to the helicopter now? Huh? I'll stop by. I'll stop by, Sam. Right, thank you. Thank you. President Trump there joking with reporters, sitting alongside the crown prince of Bahrain, one of our key allies in the Middle East, talking a lot about what we saw over the weekend, those drone strikes at the heart of Saudi Arabia's oil and industry, industry wiping out 5% of global production. Uh, President Trump saying it is looking like Iran was responsible for the attacks on Saudi, not giving much, though, in the way of what he or what Saudi Arabia is going to do about it. Uh, absolutely. I think we were wondering just slightly why Mike Pompeo and others had been more equivocal that it uh, was Iran, uh, the president, joining uh, that mentality during that press conference, but also saying uh, that diplomacy is never exhausted. And the, the key takeaway, oil price is still, of course, sharply higher on the day. 13%? 13 14%, but uh, off the peak, which was up about 18 19%. Uh, let's uh, send it over to Eamon Javis for more reaction. He is at the White House uh, for us, as always. Eamon. Yeah, Wilfred, I thought what was interesting about that comment from the president is he's inching a lot closer to attributing this attack to Iran, saying that people won't be surprised when they get the definitive results, but not saying that it was Iran. He doesn't want to formally attribute this to Iran yet, he said. He's waiting on additional information. He said his team is gathering uh, based on evidence that they have in the, re in the region. Presumably, he's talking about intelligence assets, and the president uh, not willing to go all the way to a formal attribution here. And in fact, bristling when a reporter suggested that you did just say it was Iran, the president saying, no, 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 I didn't say that. So an important bit of nuance there from the president, not willing to go quite as far as his secretary of energy uh, and his secretary of state have gone today. And guys, uh, on a separate front, uh, a little piece of news for you here. We heard the president there talking about a CEO, Mary Barra of GM, who he's met with. Uh, we now know that a number of CEOs will be taking place, taking part in a meeting at Camp David tomorrow with the vice president, Mike Pence, and Ivanka Trump. Uh, this is going to be a meeting of the American Workforce Policy Advisory Board. It's the third meeting of that group, which includes a number of CEOs and others. They're going to be having a dinner at Camp David tomorrow and uh, a tour of the facility by Mike Pence. That's a rare uh, thing. We went back to look and see if we could find any time where we've seen CEOs at Camp David uh, weren't able to find any precedent for that. So it'll be an unusual setting for the CEOs to hash out some of their issues about the economy and talk with Ivanka Trump and Mike Pence tomorrow ahead of the, the formal meeting, the third meeting of the board on Wednesday, guys. And quickly, Eamon, can I just ask you about the, this comment and um, this little question that Trump started answering about the fact that we were low on ammunition. What, what was yeah. he talking about? Well, you know, Is I don't true? know specifically. He says General Mattis told him that they were having issues with ammunition uh, in the U.S. military, and we're going to have to find out what specifically he's talking about, because he said in that meeting uh, that he's never told this story before. So uh, yeah. we're going to have to hear from the Pentagon on that and what exactly Mattis said and whether there was, in fact, an ammunition shortage. Uh, you know, a lot of times you have individual units that have ammunition depletion, particularly when they're returning from overseas. Uh, but military-wide, uh, that's the first time I'd heard that, although the president's talked a lot about the military in general he says uh, had been depleted when he came into office and his military budgets have enhanced that. I thought that was surprising too. Eamon, thank you. You bet. Eamon Javers. And by the way, Mike, Mike Pence, the vice president, will be sitting down with our Joe Kernan at this year's Delivering Alpha Investor Summit produced by CNBC and Institutional Investor. It's coming up this Thursday, September 19th in New York. So clearly he'll be asking about that 
Camp David meeting with CEOs. Yeah, fantastic uh, timing uh, and a, a great lineup throughout Delivering Alpha. Make sure you check that out, deliveringalpha.com if you haven't already. Turning back to the markets, of course, uh, they have closed. Uh, now, let's check in uh, where they closed lower, but relative to the extraordinarily large move in oil prices, you would say not that low. The Dow down half a percent, S&P down 0.3 as was the Nasdaq, Russell, uh, slightly higher. Energy, of course, the best performing sector, up 3%. Uh, you saw real estate materials, consumer discretionary lower. And Sarah, with that move in oil, we did see some safe haven trading, trading like the dollar higher, the yen higher, and some buying of bonds. But again, very small moves in all of those uh, risk uh, off trades uh, relative to the huge jump in oil prices. I was watching the consumer discretionary space. It did get hit down 1.2%. That's where you would expect to see the pain. The whole story lately has been the strength of the U.S. consumer. That's what's holding the economy up. So let's see if the U.S. consumer can deal with a sort of oil supply shock. In previous points in history, that's been painful mm -hmm. and it's caused recession. So that's going to be one of the questions. Joining us to talk about the market today, Mike Santoli, CNBC Senior Markets Commentator as always. Keith Bliss is still here, Managing Partner and CEO of IQ Capital USA. Alicia Levine, Chief Strategist at BNY Mellon Investment Management. And Paul Chang, Managing Director and Senior Equity Analyst at Scotia Howard Weil. We have a lot to get through today. Mike, set us up though in terms of that reaction that everyone's having, the market was only down this much, yeah. given such a big spike in it, oil. It, it really, uh, overall market absorbed it without much trouble. Actually, more stocks up than down today. The equal weighted S&P was flat today. So it really was a matter of what worked and what didn't, as opposed to the overall market taking a hit on the news. Obviously, the energy uh, sector getting a huge lift. But within consumer discretionary, Sarah, I would note the dollar store is down 3% each. So that was really very acute because, of course, Amazon also down almost 2% on a Wall Street Journal story. It also has GM, which was down uh, and on the, the <laughs> And the cars don't help either. Anyway, uh, but to your point, it was more about where we, we took from. I wouldn't have been surprised after a 6% rally to the cusp of an all-time high if we were down a third of a percent in the S&P today with nothing having happened over the weekend. That's how much we were down in the end. So, um, you know, you can't call anything over. Um, and uh, if, if oil keeps surging in a hurry, and it's just because of supply disruption, that's not bullish. But at this point, anyway, uh, really disturbed the overall picture. Uh, Alicia, what was your take uh, on this lack of uh, more selling from broad equity? So the first thing is that if this had happened 40 years ago, this would have been shocking, and the, you know, the oil would have been up 25, 30% in one day, and the market would have probably come down much further than half a percent. You know, the thing is, is that we've got excess reserves globally that can actually make up for the 5%, the 5, the 5 million bar barrel a day shortfall for the next three months. So there's enough excess reserve out there, particularly coming from the U.S. So in the worst case scenario, if Saudi can get supply back on the next two or three weeks, we actually can supply to keep oil prices relatively stable. The other thing just about the S&P is that the energy sector now only makes up 5% on a market cap weighted basis of the S&P. And so that's why the S&P wasn't really, you know, wasn't really up at all with energy running the way it did today. It's just a much smaller part of the S&P. Still, it raises the question, Keith, about how long this will take, right. what the next steps will be from Saudi Arabia, potentially from the United States, uh, where Iran stands. I mean, these aren't questions that are going to get answered overnight. So w would you be buying oil stocks on this? I think I would be staying away from oil stocks because we've got the commodity overbought from today's trade. So I, I honestly think that this is going to we'll wash over a little bit. We'll get some more facts coming out. There will be a response from Saudi Arabia, maybe the United States. It will not turn into an all-out shooting war with Iran, in my opinion. And then you'll see the energy stocks start to come off a little bit, too. One point I did want to make, though, talking about the, just the trend in the overall market, you see that people want to own stocks in this. Because if you look at today's action, A, what we're talking about in digesting, there was not this massive sell-off. But look at the Russell 2000. It was the only index that was green today, and it has been outperforming for the last 30 days. You would think people would make the calculus, well, oh my gosh, if small businesses have to pay more for their energy spend, which they may likely do, that's going to be a big hit to their P&L, and then you pull out of those stocks. We did not see that today. People want to stay in stocks. They're just looking, to Michael's point, looking for pockets of where they can stay. Paul, what's your take on what else to focus on for equities in the week ahead? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. I think it's important to note that uh, this attack is unprecedented. Uh, we at uh, Scotia, how we will, uh, we believe that there's two important points to note. It's not only that the scale of the, uh, the impact on the market, 
talking about more than five million barrels per day of oil, but also that for the first time in modern history, uh, we can no longer be certain 